I'm going to go through breathing and I will break this down into sections. First of all, we'll look at normal physiology and how physiology in mechanical ventilation, ventilation differs. We will look at the types of respiratory failure, respiratory assessment and examination, measuring the effects of mechanical ventilation, some common terminology you may hear in intensive care and sputum management. Ventilation refers to the movement of air in and out of the alveoli for gas exchange to occur. Normal physiology, how we breathe, is negative pressure ventilation. Physiology of spontaneous respiration requires energy to contract the muscles of respiration. The contraction of respiration muscles enlarges the thoracic cavity, creating a negative intrathoracic pressure resulting in air flow from the atmosphere into the lungs. In effect, the air is being sucked into the lungs, put very simply. Mechanical ventilation is unable to mimic this, so it uses positive pressure. Positive pressure ventilation uses a pneumatic system for the delivery of gas into the lungs during inspiration. Therefore, expiration occurs passively. The patient exhales to the level of PEEP set on the ventilator, not to atmospheric pressure. Here air in effect is being blown into the lungs instead of being sucked. You are going to hear the term PEEP a lot. PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. It is the set pressure on the ventilator that will improve oxygenation by recruiting collapsed alveoli. It is set above atmospheric pressure, normally 10 to 20 centimetres of water. What are the indications for mechanical ventilation? To make an appropriate therapeutic decision, we need to differentiate what type of respiratory failure the patient has. This is classed into type 1 or acute respiratory failure and type 2 respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure. Some patients will have a mixture of both. Type 1 respiratory failure. This occurs when the level of arterial oxygen is less than 8. The oxygen saturations will reflect this and will drop significantly as arterial oxygen decreases. This is called hypoxemia. Your patient may be very short of breath with rapid shallow breathing and is likely to be anxious and or confused as the patients become more hypoxic. Hypoxia is when the tissues are deprived of insufficient oxygen. Type 1 respiratory failure occurs from, the condition, from conditions that affect gas exchange in the alveoli. One cause of this is COVID-19, resulting in severe pneumonia, which is often bilateral in both lungs. This may result in a severe respiratory condition called ARDS or ARDS which stands for Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Put very simply, the lungs become waterlogged like sponges. Type 2 respiratory failure. This occurs when there is a failure to meet respiratory demand and this can result in hypoventilation. The patient is unable to breathe in enough volume or they cannot breathe quick enough. As a result, carbon dioxide will rise and oxygen levels will fall. Type 2 respiratory failure is a PaCO2 or carbon dioxide level greater than 6.6 .6, with a pH of less than 7.25. The pH falls as carbon dioxide makes the blood more acidic. Common causes of this are upper airway obstruction like sleep apnea, asthma and bronchospasm. It is often seen in narcotic overdoses, chest trauma or a flail chest and in any neurological condition that affects conscious level, such as a cranial bleed, trauma or CVA, and a musculoskeletal condition such as Guillain-Barre syndrome or spinal cord injury. We will now move on to respiratory assessment and physical examination. Remember, this is something you do every day as a nurse and it's just remembering those skills and looking at them in a bit more detail. Put simply, it is look, listen and feel. So look, inspection, what do you see? It's best seen at the end of the bed to look for chest movement. The first thing to do is expose the chest. Are there any obvious deformities? 
Is there equal chest expansion? This is best viewed from the end of the bed. Are there use of accessory muscles? Assess your patient's rate, rhythm and quality of respirations. Red flags here are paradoxal movement of the chest wall, which is only one side moving. Not synchronizing with the ventilator, that is, is the patient fighting the ventilator? Are they breath stacking? The ventilator will alarm. Next is feel, which is also called palpate. Feel both sides of the chest. Are, is there equal chest expansion? Can you feel vibrations? This may indicate respiratory secretions or fluid. You can confirm this by listening to the chest sounds, which takes us on to breath sounds. Auscultation, which is listening to the chest, is one of the most important examination techniques for assessing airflow throughout the lungs. To auscultate for breath sounds, press the diaphragm side of the stethoscope firmly against the skin. If you listen through clothing, the breath sounds will not be heard clearly. During auscultation, we have auscultation sites where we listen and compare each lung field and work our way down the lungs. Compare and contrast each side as one lung may be more affected than the other. Auscultation during mechanical ventilation is quite clear compared to a non-ventilated patient. You will hear the term bases a lot in intensive care this is the bottom area of your lung where gas exchange occurs the most and this is a common area for collapse. Listen underneath the armpit to, towards the back of the patient for this site of the lung. A normal breath sound is said to be vesicular. That is, it is soft and low pitched. Inspiration will last longer than expiration. There are some common, common abnormal breath sounds and what is most important is that if you are unable to hear air movement, you inform an ICU nurse. Common terms are vesicular, which is normal. Crackles are intermittent, non-musical crackling sounds caused by collapsed or fluid-filled alveoli. They are usually heard on inhalation and they may not be cleared after coughing or suctioning. Wheezes are a high-pitched musical sound caused by narrowed airways common in COPD, infection and heart failure. Again, red flags, no chest sound with no limited or chest expansion means call for help urgently. It is important to know that a doctor and a physiotherapist will assess the patient's breathing each day. There is support for you as this is a skill that was, requires practice. How do we measure the effects of mechanical ventilation on gas exchange? We look at oxygen saturations and carbon dioxide. These are shown on the monitor, ventilator and on the arterial blood gas or ABG. During COVID-19, it may not be possible to take the normal amount of blood gases for ventilated patients. So if you are unfamiliar with interpreting ABGs, do not worry. What is important is the oxygen saturation and carbon dioxide levels which may be new to you. Carbon dioxide monitoring is called capnography. The waveform or trace is important as it tells us the tube is in the right position and the patient is ventilating. If the waveform is flat or dampened, seek urgent assistance from the ICU nurse. This is what a normal CO2 waveform looks like. In sicker patients, the doctor will allow for a higher than normal carbon dioxide this is called permissive hypercapnia, and you will be guided by this. A normal CO2 is 4.6 to 6. Moving on to ventilators and common terminology. Many units use different ventilators and modes. Know what's common in your area. In COVID-19, it is likely the patient will not be breathing themselves and will be said to be fully ventilated, which means it is unlikely there will be spontaneous breaths. With all the modes, there are key words that you will hear a lot of. These are FiO2, which is the fraction of inspired oxygen, 
which is a different way of measuring oxygen in a, a decimal point. So 0 0.3 is equal to 30% oxygen. Peak pressure, this is the pressure due to the sum of airway pressure and alveoli pressure. PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Tidal volume, this is the volume of air expired during one breath. And minute volume, the total volume expired over one minute, which is tidal volume times the respiratory rate. But the ventilator will do this for you. Ventilation does not come, out, come without its risks. Increased pressure in the thoracic cavity can cause lung tra trauma. This is called barotrauma. An ICU nurse will guide you on what to monitor. There is also an increased risk of secondary lung infection, known as ventilator-acquired pneumonia, or VAP. To prevent this, you must keep the patient's head elevated to 30 degrees, and there will be a care bundle for this on your unit. It is important to know that ventilators alarm a lot. Seek reassurance and support from your ICU nurse. As scary as it may feel, you are not alone. Last but not least, sputum management. Intubated and ventilated patients are unable to cough and clear their own secretions. They are also unable to warm and humidify the oxygen. Humidification attached to the ventilator is vital. You will check the humidification regularly and an ICU nurse can show you how to do this. Endotracheal suctioning is the term used to suction down the ET tube to clear sputum. You will hear the term closed suctioning. This enables secretions to be suctioned without breaking the circuit to atmospheric pressure and therefore losing your PEEP. The technique of suctioning needs to be practiced with an experienced intensive care nurse.